Hello everyone, Eric Hurst here with another episode of Training Cafe. This time coming from rainy Kentucky, where you can see outside maybe cloudy skies back there, uh, and uh, not very good climbing weather, but that's okay. I'm here to talk training and climbing with you guys. And I don't really have any topic in mind today, so I thought we would keep this episode short and sweet, and I would answer some of your training questions. I see a couple have been typed into the comments box already, uh, and I'll get to those in just a minute. For other folks just tuning in here, please do, uh, if you have a you know question on training, outdoor climbing, indoor climbing, nutrition, recovery, injury, uh, anything goes. So you can type in a quick comment and I'd be happy to uh, give you the best answer I can. And if I can't answer it, I'm always honest about uh, it and we'll try to refer you to a location or a person that hopefully can give you a uh, meaningful answer that can help you in your climbing journey. Of course, this is the Training Cafe and that means I've got coffee and hopefully you do too. And so this is that time where climbers around the world unite and we sip coffee together. The sip heard around the world because we are streaming live to all countries, uh, though uh, it's uh, um, tragic and uh, it's uh, just a, a madness that is uh, going on in Ukraine. And while I don't want to go off on a tangent, I know the Ukrainian climbers uh, are a passionate group, uh, and you know my book Training for Climbing is actually in the process of being translated to, uh, you know, a Ukrainian uh, journal or book. Uh, though that is the last thing on my mind right now with uh, the craziness going on, and uh, I've traded some notes with some of my German friends, uh, and they uh, have uh, U Ukrainian friends and. Uh, it's they're all just kind of in shock, you know, how the world has changed in the last 10 days. And uh, hopefully the madness will soon end over there. Uh, but it's going to be a long time for uh, life to get back to normal in Ukraine, sadly. And so uh, climbing and talking about climbing is small stuff, you know, compared to that bigger stuff. But it's also uh, for each of us in our own way, a getaway from uh, the problems we have in our lives or that we see in the world. And though uh, I like to think that what we get out of climbing, uh, though it is mostly self-serving and self-gratifying, you know, the act of climbing, it does make us stronger, more capable people that we can hopefully uh, take, take what we uh, gain from the you know, climbing world and our climbing achievements and share that with the world and uplift uh, and give back in some way, which is something I try to do in various avenues. And, you know, in, in all of my books, I try to be uh, uh, right with an uplifting mindset of uh, uh, appreciating life and what we have. And so uh, long story short, at this point, it's just prayers for uh, Ukraine. I'm not sure what else we can do or most of us can do. Uh, but we hope for a quick resolution and uh, return to some sanity there. So in any case, uh, I guess one more thing I want to mention here uh, before I move on to your questions is uh, a new podcast that's coming out this week. I think Wednesday is when the episode will release. A friend of mine from uh, Louisville, Kentucky, uh, his name is Ryan Devlin, and he's releasing a new podcast called The Struggle. Now, Ryan is uh, somewhat new to climbing. He's been climbing maybe five or six years. He was a trad climber in California. He's actually a Hollywood actor and producer and has been quite, he and his wife have been quite successful in Hollywood. But when they started a family, they moved to Kentucky and they live in Louisville. Uh, and so I've uh, uh, helped uh, train him a little bit over the past year or two and we've climbed together a bit. Uh, and Ryan's a terrific guy with great energy and a huge passion for climbing. And so he pitched uh, to me last fall this idea of a podcast and perhaps someday a TV show called The Struggle that would feature, uh, feature some of the world's best climbers. So I helped hook him up to some of the world's best climbers. 
and uh, he's been busy recording some incredible podcasts. I've sampled a couple of them, and uh, I, the first episode uh, launches on uh, this Wednesday, the 9th of March. So if you are a podcast kind of person, you know, when you're traveling and driving, uh, this would be one you want to subscribe and add to your rotation. Uh, and it's called The Struggle. If you search iTunes, he has a, a trailer there that you can listen to uh, and uh, subscribe so that you get notification when uh, the new podcasts roll out every couple of weeks here going forward. I think he has eight or ten of them recorded and I expect all of them to be fantastic. Uh, and the focus is the struggle of being a pro climber and everything that comes along with it. You know, for some people, it's more of a physical struggle. Others, it's more mental, perhaps spiritual. And uh, he delves into all of that with these uh, pro climbers. And it makes for uh, compelling listening. And it's, I found, a very inspirational content. And being that Ryan is a uh, Hollywood kind of guy, it's very well produced. And uh, so uh, it's tight and quick. It's not a three-hour podcast. It's like 45 minutes of lean into it and enjoy kind of podcast. And so I hope you'll give Struggle a listen. And I also don't want to overlook like, my own podcast, the Training for Climbing podcast, a new episode released today. Uh, and uh, so that is on your uh, phone or your podcast player or on your computer to listen to right now. It's called 40 Ways to Take Your Training and Climbing to the Next Level. Uh, this is part one of a two-part. The second part will be released uh, two weeks from today. So I hope you uh, continue to enjoy the podcast that I generate. Okay, so enough said there. One more sip of coffee and we'll get to your questions. And... Let me put my reading glasses on here so I can uh, hopefully properly interpret your questions that you've typed in. Uh, first up is uh, Hamza. He says, uh, for mainly indoor climbers, uh, how should the session focus uh, more on limit climbing and crux moves uh, or volume? And, you know, how, uh, I guess it's a common question from people is how much of one or the other should you do? And... There's no simple answer to this question because everybody's in a unique place with their performance and what their strengths and weaknesses are. I mean, as a rule of thumb, people that climb a lot of routes could probably benefit from doing a little more bouldering and vice versa. Uh, for someone that's just an indoor climber, uh, I think it's my experience that the bouldering is so engaging and especially with the system walls, there it's really... Um, something that draws you in uh, to spending a lot of time on. And therefore, I, I would venture a guess that the average person who's mainly indoor climber might overdose on the kind of the crux moves, the limit moves on boulders and system wall and not tie in enough and get enough climbing volume. Uh, and there's a number of reasons for that. I mean, certainly from a bioenergetics standpoint, we want to develop all three of our energy systems. And if all you do is boulder, you really miss out on the climbing specific aerobic conditioning that you get from tying into a rope and climbing, you know, multiple routes that take you five minutes or so. Uh, and, you know, those volume sessions have tremendous value, especially when you're on climbs a couple of grades below your limit where you're not falling, but you're flowing. And if you climb hundreds of feet of rock and uh, are in kind of that flow state where you can really feel what you're doing and refine your technique and your, your movement efficiency, that's what you're really after. So it's not just training the aerobic energy system, but it's also about becoming a better climber. Uh, when you're doing limit stuff, limit moves, uh, limit boulders, it's just all out try hard. Uh, and oftentimes you're doing moves sloppily or you're powering through them it's not you're not doing them the most efficient way you could and while that is okay you know to kind of do a hardest move that's how we all are when we do our hardest move it's not a beautiful thing necessarily it can be kind of a grovel or a grunt but if you repeat that move and over time learn to kind of polish the performance kind of like a gymnast or an ice skater repeating their routine over and over and over to polish the performance that is when you become a real master of movement. And so for someone to just get on hard stuff at their limit and thrash through it, 
and never come back to polish the performance or never do that lower intensity uh, flow state climbing, well then, you know, I think you're handicapping yourself. You, you may get stronger because you're doing hard moves, but you may not become a more skilled mover over stone. And then the other downside to just doing or having too much focus on those hard moves is the threat of injury. You know, when you're grabbing a little tweak, you know, crimper tweak or a pocket and doing, you know, one or two hard moves and falling off and then doing it again and again and again, you keep stressing, you know, maybe it's an arm position or maybe it's a finger position that's tweaky. You keep stressing it in the exact same way over and over and over. And so it, that becomes an injury risk. Whereas again, when you're climbing submaximally flowing over stone climbing routes, though injury is not impossible, I think it's less likely in those settings. So the bottom line to answer your question, I really um, think most climbers can benefit from more of an 80-20 split. I'm not saying 80% routes and 20 bouldering. I'm saying 80% of your time climbing things that are submaximal. So that could be submaximal volume climbing on routes, or it could be submaximal volume climbing on boulders and system wall, where you're not climbing at your limit, but you're doing um, lower intensity boulders and having less rest in between, and you know therefore accumulating moves. Or as I like to talk about, you know, count the moves of your session or even the feet you climbed in your session and not gauge your session just on absolute difficulty. 20% uh, of your time, work on hard stuff, you know, closer to your or at your limit, but 80% below the limit by some amount. Okay, uh, let's move on here um, to the next question. Um, and I, <laughs> I see a uh, hot... Hamza is gone for a second question here, so let's just take care of this one really quick. Um, can density hangs for tenon health be used year-round, or should they be cycled on and off? Uh, are density hangs and max hangs in the same cycle counterproductive? Well, I, I mean, I, I don't want to go down too deep of a rabbit hole here, but the whole idea of density hangs, um, you know, that's something that's been around for people uh, rehabbing, let's say, Achilles tendon injuries, where you would do slow isometric or a long isometric or a slow eccentric, which has um, loading on a tendon for 30 or 45 seconds. Uh, so it could be holding a pull up position for 30 seconds. It could be you know, a fingerboard hang for 30 seconds, or in the case of an Achilles rehab, it could be uh, holding a, uh, a toe lift or slowly uh, lowering through the eccentric of a um, toe raise with m moderately high load. And what that does is that allows the collagen fibers to slide. It helps break cross links um, and makes the tendon more compliant. And that's a good thing for tendon health. It's a good thing to give a signal for collagen synthesis to help heal a, uh, an injury. It's not the best thing for performance, however, uh, because for performance, for an uninjured climber wanting to perform at their highest, you actually want cross-linking. You want more cross-linking, not less. That makes the tendon stiffer as opposed to making the tendon more compliant, which is what density hangs do. Uh, and a stiffer tendon transfers force more quickly and also more efficiently. There's less energy lost. And so when you're climbing for performance, if you're dead pointing or campusing or you're doing powerful movements, you want to have the muscle tendon system as efficient as possible and you want the highest rate of force development possible. And you get both of those from tendon stiffness. And so doing density hangs right before a climbing trip or right before a competition or right before, you know, in the weeks leading up to trying to do your hardest boulder or routes of the year would be a big mistake. Uh, the density hangs are more something you do off season or most importantly, as part of a rehab for an injury. And if you're rehabbing an injury, well, then you're obviously not heading into competition. You're not heading into trying to do your hardest uh, sends. And so the whole density hang thing is more appropriately used 
uh, in the early stages of a training block, if you have a 10 or 12 week training block, so the early you know portion of that, it could be when you're doing your max load training, you know, to build strength uh, uh, safely, and then you transition into more fast movements and campus training and things that actually increases cross-linking and stiffness in the system as you finish the the, the training block and head into the performance period. Um, and again, you know, the best use of that uh, type of slow eccentric or long duration isometric is uh, during uh, the rehab from an injury. Uh, okay, uh, let's move on here. Uh, how long should I wait after breakfast when drinking a supercharged collagen to get the empty stomach effect? Well, that's a good question. I mean, it really depends on what your breakfast is. If your breakfast is just um, a piece of fruit or a, a bowl of porridge or oatmeal, uh, probably, you know, 90 minutes is enough and then you would be able to consume your uh, supercharged collagen and then head into your finger training or your climbing workout or what I try to do and a lot of uh, climbers try to do if they're in a training block you know they may wake up and be in mainly a fasted state for the first few hours they're up maybe they have coffee uh, uh, and uh, consume hydrolyzed collagen uh, as a, a pre-workout to get that spike of the collagen specific amino acids into the bloodstream and then go to the gym uh, or train at home uh, a short strength power session or a rehab session you know it might just be a, a one hour workout type thing that doesn't involve a lot of volume uh, but is more short and to the point uh, and so doing on the empty stomach, you know, even after the all night fast, the collagen, you get that rapid spike into your bloodstream of the collagen specific amino acids. And then when you're loading your tendons, uh, that is what through fluid diffusion draws those uh, collagen specific amino acids into the, you know, tissues to be utilized and to spur on that process of collagen synthesis and remodeling. And so if you do kind of that morning session on the fasted stomach and then eat kind of a brunch after the workout, that's how I do it almost all the time when I'm kind of in training mode at home is, you know, I wake up fasted stomach, have my coffee in the morning, do a little bit of work <clears throat> on the computer. And then I have my collagen and do a, a brief workout from like 10 to 11 a.m and then have my first real meal of the day after that workout. Uh, so it's kind of more of a brunch or a lunch. Uh, and then, you know, that way I have a good 12 hour fast from the night before, uh, which is I think a good thing for many people to do something like that. And I don't wanna go down the intermittent fasting rabbit hole here, but uh, it can be beneficial. But uh, if you do eat a little bit of a breakfast, then you wanna give yourself at least an hour or two. And if it's a massive breakfast, which I'm generally not an advocate of, you know, like pancakes and eggs, well, then that could be, you know, three hours until you can have an empty stomach to, to consume the collagen and do the workout. So, uh, yeah, hopefully that gives you a sense of things there and how to go about it. Okay, Marco says, what do you think about organizing the week as follows? A Monday, antagonist core, Tuesday, campus and hangboarding, Wednesday, boulder, Thursday, aerobic threshold training, Friday, rest, and then weekend outside route climbing. And uh, my first impression is uh, for a more advanced climber, that could be a pretty good program uh, as long as the volume is controlled. Uh, but they are the, the uh, Monday is more or less a rest day for your climbing muscles after the weekend of climbing. The Tuesday you're doing kind of, it's a brief, powerful kind of workout with, I would assume, some kind of max hang or min edge protocol uh, and some campusing and, and lots of rest. So uh, it's then followed by bouldering on Wednesday and then more uh, that aerobic threshold is more of a volume day right at the aerobic threshold, which I'm a big fan of being where you get moderately pumped, but not deeply pumped. So you know you're just right on that threshold between you know maximizing the aerobic stimulation and just 
touching into the anaerobic zone, but not going too deep. Uh, and then the rest on Friday. You know, and if you're outdoor climbing a weekend, chances are you're probably pushing yourself and getting deeply pumped. So that's kind of your anaerobic lactic session. So this is an example of daily undulating periodization. And uh, if anything, it uh, for somebody with not a lot of climbing experience or a lot of loading history, it might be a little too much, uh, you know, in terms of that Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, they're all loading the fingers, and then Friday and Saturday is loading the fingers. So that's like five days a week of loading the fingers, which for somebody, you know, for many people might be too many days of, of a week to load the fingers. I often say for more beginner intermediate types, it should be three to at most four days a week of loading the fingers. Uh, but you know, not all loading is the same, obviously, depending how you schedule your program. And uh, But again, for a more elite climber with 10 years of loading history and no injuries, that, that could be uh, a really good schedule there. Okay, on to Jess. Uh, I just hurt my ankle on a hard lead fall. And I'm sorry to hear that, Jess. Um, I am in the third week of an aerobic block of the 4-3-2-1 training uh, routine for a trip. So kind of a 10 week training block uh, leading into a trip. So I like that, that you're doing that. Um, and I'm thinking of going straight to the strength block, any exercises you recommend. Well, yeah, I mean, if you hurt your ankle, then maybe you can't do uh, the, because that, are, that four weeks of more climbing specific aerobic training would involve a lot of climbing uh, in the gym or submaximal climbing outdoors. Uh, and uh, perhaps you can't do that now that you hurt your ankle. So yes, uh, you just need to work around that. And uh, the worst thing you could do at this point is um, just stop climbing. You know, oh, I'm injured. I can't climb. So I'm just going to, you know, throw in the towel for a few weeks till my ankle gets better. And why, why do that? You know, so I would kind of forget the four, three, two, one thing uh, at this point, since you have this more urgent need, which is to get the ankle to heal itself. Uh, and so while I don't want to go, I don't know the nature of the injury, um, you know, hopefully it's minor and it's something that you can work through in a couple of weeks uh, and, and still have your trip uh, to enjoy. Uh, and so at this point, I would focus on, um, you know, what you can do without hurting the ankle. Maybe it's just hangboard training, antagonist training, core training, uh, and if that's the case, you can still stay in pretty good condition. And what I would do is I would do, you know, one day of the hangboard training, which is a more strength-oriented hangboard workout, and maybe, you know, strength-oriented pull-up workout and strength-oriented core workout. And then the next day, you could do a very submaximal workout where you're doing fingerboard repeaters at less than body weight set up a pulley system or put your feet on a chair. And so while the first day of strength training on the hangboard is gonna be near limit training, brief intense hangs, that next day should be the opposite of that, where you're never getting anywhere close to failure, you're doing repeaters at less than body weight. So it's kind of like climbing in that regard, uh, that you're doing lots of hangs, but at a very low, you know, 30 to 50% type intensity. Uh, and you're getting the uh, aerobic energy system engaged, getting blood flowing, uh, getting the mitochondria or factories cranking out ATP. Uh, and so that's very beneficial in preparation for your trip. Uh, and, uh, you know, and then a rest day and then repeat that. So you might train four days a week on the hangboard. Two days would be the max strength and two days would be the more aerobic oriented. Uh, and, you know, again, doing everything else to try to stay in shape uh, and work around the ankle injury and then hopefully get back into top rope and leading as soon as you can, uh, hopefully in a couple of weeks. So uh, yeah, hopefully that helps you out there, Jess, and you can uh, continue with your trip. Okay, uh, Mark says, can you share some thoughts on min edge versus max weight hangs? Uh, he says, I can hang with 70 pounds added on a 15 millimeter and but the 10 millimeters hard without weight so i guess at body weight hanging on the 10 millimeter is hard and there's a big difference obviously between a 15 and a 10 uh, especially if it's a slippery wooden edge 
the added specificity of min hangs seems beneficial for tiny crimps outside. Absolutely right, Mark. And so uh, I think uh, I tend to encourage people during the off season, if they're kind of in a strength building phase, to emphasize more the, the weighted hang protocols on comfortable edges uh, between 15 and even as big as 24. It's got to be something less than a full pad. So for me, I, you know, I'm a more experienced advanced climber. I do my weighted hangs on 14s, uh, but a lot of people just go for the you know 20 millimeter or Beast Maker 23 millimeter, which is um, you know a little less than a full pad, and that's a good size edge to train the flexor digitorum profundus in kind of that half crimp or open crimp grip uh, with the weighted hangs. That being said, you know, you go outside and grab eight millimeter rock crimps or 10 millimeter rock crimps, it feels quite different. You know, the strength does transfer, but there's also the the tissue, the, the pulp at the tip of the finger that plays more of a role in those little sharp outdoor edges and holding on to them. And so you can get some additional training adaptations that are a little more specific, as you say, by training on smaller edges. And if you have one of those Ava Lopez boards that goes all the way down to six millimeter, uh, or maybe a, the tension board that uh, has uh, tension makes some tools that have eight and six edges and some other companies as well, I think spending a little time grabbing six is extreme for most people, but tens or eights at body weight or even a little less than body weight, I think there's some value. And kind of getting back how to apply all this, you can do it all in the same session. If you have a day, if on Tuesday you're doing kind of a max grip strength and maybe max pull-up type workout, weighted pull-ups, uh, you know, I would go through a thorough warm-up and then when you're getting to kind of those few sets of really hard efforts or intense efforts, uh, maybe first do um, one uh, set of weighted on the larger holds, and then after a three-minute rest, do a set or two of unweighted on the smaller, you know, eight or ten millimeters at body weight uh, to give yourself some exposure to that very specific, you know, feel of holding those smaller edges. And then go back and do one or two more sets of the weighted hangs on the slightly bigger edge. Uh, and that, I think, is a good way of blending the two together uh, since you're, you know, your focus now is going into outdoor climbing. Uh, doing a pure off-season training routine, then you might just focus on the weighted hangs and not worry about those painful smaller uh, edges uh, until you are ready to transition into your outdoor climbing season. Okay, on we go here to Jeremy. Um, I am a lower limb paraclimber who can't run at all or walk for long periods of time. Uh, I consume 100 grams or a bit more of protein a day and I'm eating 1900 calories, but I'm stagnant at 205. Any tips? Uh, well, first of all, I'm uh, so excited to hear from you, Jeremy. I'm glad that you're climbing. Uh, I have quite a few paraclimber friends and a few that I've coached over the years. And um, I, I, you know, Ronnie Dixon uh, is and Craig DiMartino are friends of mine and they're Fizzy Vantage athletes. And uh, they have shown that, you know, uh, they aren't really handicapped. You know, they're incredible climbers uh, and athletes. And yes, it is um, difficult, uh, you know, if you're trying to uh, reshape your body a little bit and lose a few LBs to, uh, you know, help you peak heading into performance season. Uh, you know, you can't run or, uh, uh, you know, walk. Uh, so much, I would say, is it a possibility of access to a rowing machine? Is that um, an option for doing a few days of cardio per week and just kind of getting your heart beating fast? Uh, you know, that might be one option for you. Uh, I like uh, that you're getting 100 grams of protein. You know, you sound like someone who's probably pretty dedicated to training. And so, getting at minimum 80 grams and the t 100's a good target that I aim for and most climbers, um, especially bigger climbers like yourself, ought to be getting. 
Uh, and you have to be careful if you're consuming all of that protein as whole foods, well, then you can go crazy on your calories. Uh, obviously, you can end up easily at 3,000 calorie days and be putting on weight. And so for strength power athletes, and this transcends climbing, this is Olympic level jumpers and sprinters, they're hitting 100 grams or more of protein, but keeping the calories low. And you can do that with whole foods, but it's harder. You know, you really, that's where the supplementary protein powders like whey isolate can come in really handy, or a good plant-based protein can come in handy. Uh, and it sounds like you're doing all this great. And so I don't have, uh, unfortunately, any profound advice to give you, uh, except maybe to see, you know, if you have access to a Concept2 rowing machine or something like that, perhaps that's something that you can do that doesn't cause problems. Uh, so give that a try. And otherwise, just stay the course and, you know, you will continue to improve as a climber, uh, I, I believe, uh, through passion, through, uh, you know, continuing to improve your climbing technique uh, and get climbing specific strength gains and uh, you know fitness gains uh, and even if you never break below 200 pounds you can continue to improve as a climber uh, a few more questions here and then we'll wrap this uh, episode up uh, hey Eric I uploaded on your website some training plans and I did the three two one cycle for intermediate program uh, I asked myself if the aerobic endurance workout is the same as aerobic conditioning. No, it's not. Um, you know, the the four, three, two, one, ten week cycle, that's four weeks of um, climbing specific aerobic training along with some generalized aerobic training. Uh, that's what the four weeks is about. Uh, for a boulderer, you could debate if somebody is just a boulder you know, specialist, you could debate whether that four weeks is necessary. The three is strength and power training, the two is the anaerobic lactic energy system, and then the one is kind of a deload week heading into performance, heading into performance climbing, or before you do the whole cycle again. And so the four, three, two, one uh, is a, a blueprint for someone beginner, intermediate, who's getting into training, it's a good kind of base training program, off-season training program. It's not an elite level program. It doesn't provide the nuance you need for an advanced or an elite level climber where, you know, that DUP program that is really specialized for the person and for their goals, that's the more advanced and elite level program. Uh, but for beginner intermediate as a place to start, the four, three, two, one's pretty good. And if you're just a boulder specialist, maybe you can drop the four. But as far as that four, it's a lot of submaximal climbing uh, on a rope uh, or on submaximal boulders for volume, never climbing to failure or rarely reaching failure. You're focusing on movement. You're focusing on uh, high volume of moves, feet climbed. You know, you should be climbing hundreds of feet per session, not five or 10 boulders per session, which is what a boulderer does. Uh, you know, so that gives you kind of this climbing specific aerobic con conditioning. Above and beyond that, you could add in, and I do encourage most climbers to add in some generalized aerobic training because there's value there as well for the cardiovascular, for the strengthening the heart and increasing the stroke volume. All that feeds back and supports your climbing. And so doing a, a two, three days a week of some moderate running or some other form of aerobic activity uh, can be beneficial. Really throughout the climbing year, throughout the training cycle, you can do some of that generalized training. If you're really interested in um, you know, getting the most out of your training time and climbing your best, that is something that's kind of helps support recovery between climbs, between days of climbing, a stronger generalized aerobic energy system is very helpful. And I'll tell you, you know, some of the pro climbers I've worked with uh, are inc just amazing. You know, they have resting heart rates in the 40s. And that's the stuff of marathon runners, even though these guys aren't marathon runners. Now, they are big wall climbers. They are, you know, trad climbers who do 10, 20, 30 pitches in a day. They are sport climbers who go out and put long days at the sport crag in. And so for their resting heart rate to be in the 40s or 50s is quite remarkable and maybe shocking to people to know that there are elite climbers that have that level of cardiovascular conditioning. You know, that's evidence of a strong heart that can really push a lot of blood with every stroke. 
And that has been shown in research to equate to faster recovery between boulders, faster recovery between climbs, faster recovery while hanging out on a climb, shaking where you're trying to get back, you know, your you know, recover mid route. All of that is um, advanced and supported by having a stronger heart. Uh, and so there is a lot of value in doing that type of training, though a lot of climbers I know sadly just write it off and say, running's not gonna help me climb harder. And while it's not gonna help you move better, that's true, it will help you perform better and recover faster and therefore climb harder. Okay, a couple more here real quick. Um, running a DUP, so uh, he says he's using a DUP, one day anaerobic capacity, one day strength power. Uh, if you had to miss one because of uh, being busy, which one would it be and why? Um, if you're an on-season climber, uh, if you're currently climbing outdoors for performance, I would probably skip the one day strength and power if you had to give up one because of a busy schedule. Uh, you know, if it was, if you're kind of in a training mode and not climbing for performance, then I'd probably skip the anaerobic capacity and stay with the strength power because you want to be building that and maintaining that week over week. And you need at least one session a week to do that. So there's a short answer for you. Okay, I uh, appreciate the kind comments there, Christian. Um, Bay Rock Climber says, what's the difference between strength endurance and power endurance? Uh, you know, not much. Uh, they both speak to um, having a strong anaerobic lactic energy system. Uh, you know, when you do a very intense exercise or move in climbing or sequence in climbing where you're grabbing a few limit holds or making a few limit moves, you know, think about the max hang on a hangboard, think about the max campus move on a campus board, that's anaerobic alactic. It's all stored creatine phosphate in the muscle cells and it has a very finite uh, you know, ability to support exercise for just a few seconds. By 10 seconds, it's pretty much gone. And that's why you can do limit campusing for maybe five to 10 seconds and then you just can't go anymore. To sustain exercise beyond that, like if you have a long crux sequence or a long boulder where you have to do hard moves for 30 or 40 or 50 seconds, that moves you into that anaerobic lactic zone, which is a bridge between the alactic and the aerobic energy system. And that anaerobic lactic zone is also a finite anaerobic reserve, uh, but it's fueled by anaerobic glycolysis, which is good because it can sustain pretty high power, not as high as the alactic, but pretty high power for 10, 20, 30 seconds. But the consequence is it generates hydrogen ions, which results in acidification of the muscle cells, the working muscles. It gives you that burn, which ultimately shuts down the anaerobic uh, lactic energy system. And it creates lactate, which is uh, not a, a, a bad byproduct, but it is a byproduct that needs to be metabolized. It can't just accumulate forever. So it needs to be circulated to the liver to be turned back into glycogen. It needs to be used by slow twitch fibers to fuel the aerobic energy system. It needs to be dealt with, just like the hydrogen ions need to be dealt with. So the bottom line is that lactic support, you know, for intense exercise for 20, 30, 40 seconds is going to run aground by one minute. You know, your power is going to drop off rapidly. And if you're going to sustain climbing after that, it needs to be lower intensity. Uh, and so strength endurance and power endurance training all speak to, you know, how long you can maintain that pretty high power level as you're, you know, going from, you know, 20 to 30 to 40 seconds. Some climbers drop off a cliff. You know, if they're doing a crux sequence, after 20 seconds, they're, they're gone. Whereas other climbers, like an Adam Andra, you know, on silence, he was able to sustain that high power for about 50 seconds and then he falls off the cliff. 
not literally, but his power production falls off the cliff. And that's why on silence, he needed to perfect those sequences and be able to move fast enough through them that he would get to the next rest and recovery position in under 50 seconds. So when he was working that V13 crux on silence with the crazy upside down moves and everything, when he was first working it, it was taking him a minute 10 and he couldn't do it. But on Sunday, he did it in 45 or 50 seconds. So he was able to get through it before his energy production fell off a cliff. And so in any case, that is what strength endurance and power endurance is all about. And so we think of strength endurance as like, um, you know, more like hangboard repeaters at a pretty high intensity, you know, how many of those you could do in a row before your power production falls off and you can't go on. You know, you pump out, you power out. Uh, and the power endurance is more like you think of powerful movements. Like, um, uh, you know, if you're doing campusing on a big rung, like those biggest rungs that your whole body is, if you laddered up and laddered down and laddered up and laddered down, that's a very powerful, albeit sub-maximal, exercise. And so, you know, that's actually one good metric for power endurance in the upper body is you get on those biggest runs, rungs and measure how long can you campus up and down. You know, some people can only go for 20 seconds. Others can go for 40 seconds. Um, and so that is more a measure of power endurance, whereas like repeaters at body weight on a 14 millimeter edge might be a good measure of strength endurance is how many of those you can do in a row. Uh, it's measuring the same thing. It's the same energy system, but it's just kind of, you know, speaks to two different applications of that energy system. I hope that made sense. <laughs> so, and there I gave you the examples of both. Um, and so, you know, and Jeremy's just asking any tips for cutting weight. I think I kind of spoke about the best I, I could to your situation. Uh, there, Jeremy. Uh, I think, you know, elite performers do have their body weight go up and down and fluctuate somewhat throughout the year, you know, up a little bit during a training block, down a little bit heading into competition or a performance block. Uh, you can't diet yourself to success in, in climbing. Uh, that isn't sustainable and it will eventually get you injured and demoralized and it's no fun way to live life. But just tweaking your diet, refining your diet, keeping it healthy, but making it just you know, as performance oriented as possible is what we're after during performance season. And that means keeping protein high and generally reducing calorie load a little bit. Uh, next question is, um, hey coach, I'm in the Pittsburgh area. We do uh, lots of great bouldering around Pennsylvania. Uh, you're in Lancaster County, correct? And yes, I am in Lancaster. Um, and uh, do you have any local areas you like for bouldering? Well, you know, uh, the bouldering in my part of Pennsylvania isn't fantastic. There's no Bishop or Waco, that is for sure. But there are some die base areas like Mount Gretna and Governor Stables. I was an early developer at Governor Stables back in the 19, early 1980s, mid-1980s, a long time ago. Uh, though admittedly, I don't do a lot of bouldering outdoors in Pennsylvania anymore uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, you know, I mainly train in the comfort of my home or at a local gym, uh, and then I try to travel and route climb outdoors. I, at my age, uh, uh, don't do so much bouldering. I, I'm not the whole jumping off and taking potentially injurious bouldering falls isn't something I'm after at, at this stage of the game. Uh, but it's a great activity. I hope you enjoy it. And I know out in southwestern PA, there is a lot of, of good bouldering to be had. Um, next question from Aaron. Hi, Coach Hurst. Uh, I'm 32 years old. been diagnosed with arthritis in my right big toe. Uh, and it can get painful uh, on slades. I'm not sure what that is. Uh, what does this mean for my climbing future? that's hard to say. Um, you know, I mean, I have some early stage arthritis in my DIP joint of a few fingers and, you know, toes obviously are, are you know, stressed uh, in a tight climbing shoe. Um, and, uh, you know, everybody's a little different. You know, some people genetically are more predisposed 
to arthritis and early onset, which maybe you are, though I wouldn't jump to conclusions. Uh, maybe search for more comfortable shoes. Maybe have a very comfortable pair that you can do all of your warm up climbing, your gym climbing in, and then a tighter performance pair of shoes that might hurt the toe, but only wear those shoes when you're doing your hardest routes or boulders. That might be a workaround. You know, you have to try to reduce the stress in the toe, make it comfortable, reduce the pain as best as you can, and then maybe tolerate the pain when you're trying to do your, your hardest boulders. Uh, I'm not a big fan of chronic NSAID use because that's such a systemic thing that has been proven to have negative effects on a few organs and on connective tissues and can actually potentially make matters worse uh, daily use. There is some new NSAID cream. I think it's called Volterin, something like that, uh, that you can buy over the counter like at CVS or Walgreens that is NSAID cream. So you can topically apply it to a finger or to a big toe uh, and deal with the pain and maybe a little bit of inflammation on game day in that way, but not flood your body with it as you would if you took a bunch of Advil. Uh, and so I think you just have to kind of deal with it, uh, make adjustments to your shoes to help maybe slow the progression or just deal with the pain and discomfort. Um, and I think the same thing applies to any climber of any age, wherever that body part is, uh, is try to reduce the stress on the body part that might be something that makes the condition worse, try to work around it by adjusting your technique, your gear, your shoes, the way you grab holds. Like for my finger, um, when I crimp it, it is more problematic than when I open hand. So I try to open hand as much as I can. And so I think we all have to kind of learn to adapt, especially if we want to stay in the game long term. Uh, you know, if you're an NFL player, they make a lot of sacrifices long term to perform short term because their careers are quite short in the NFL, on average three, four years, if you're lucky, 10 or 15 years. Uh, but they make a lot of sacrifices uh, for the short term that are going to cost them in the long term. But if you're a 30 something climber or a 40 something or me, a 50 something climber, and your goal is to stay in the game as long as you can, well, then you have to make some compromises. Uh, and try to work around your problems and uh, you know don't give up trying to push your performance but try to you know adapt to the situation and what your unique situation is in terms of training stress uh, and helping set yourself up for hopefully many more years of climbing performance okay enough time here uh, just for one or two more and then we're gonna wrap things up here um, uh, this climber says, I live in California, really don't have an off season. How would I organize my training without an off season? Uh, most of the programs you and others talk about involve off season training. Yeah, that's right. And I mean, you're in a unique situation if you're in Southern California. Uh, people that live in Arizona or Nevada, you know, have a year round season. And I, I guess I would consider for you, um, what is your your what is the time of year you're gonna maybe go on a road trip or a longer trip? You know, is there a time of year where you're more likely to go to Waco for two weeks or go to Yosemite for two weeks uh, or travel to Europe for a month or you know some trip like that is kind of more your on season and then you kind of view your time when you're climbing locally. As you know, it's not off season, obviously, if you're still climbing locally year round, but maybe that is a period where you can be a little more focused on training, on uh, trying to take some key performance indicators to the next level by doing two days in the gym that really target, you know, training exercises that can advance those key performance indicators, but yet still give yourself enough recovery time that you can climb locally on the weekends or. Uh, and, and do well, um, you know, and then when you do know you have a trip coming, then try to train in a way that you reach some kind of a peak, you know, a training peak with, you know, an appropriate deload ahead of your trip. And so that everything lines up that when you do go to Yosemite for two weeks, or you do go to Waco for two weeks, or you do go to Europe for a month, 
that you have some type of a peak uh, that you aren't you know, uh, tweaky from bouldering 52 straight weeks in California or you know, climbing y year round. Uh, I, I think there needs to be some type of you know, some phasing to your training where you know, uh, volume and intensity varies in some way month to month because you just can't go high volume, high intensity year round. That is not sustainable. It will result in injury and burnout and you know, eventually a um, retreat in performance. Uh, so you need to kind of consider the whole year and uh, find a way to add some variance to it season over season. And I would say start with when your travel might be and then work backwards. Okay, um, and Jill says, yes, uh, shoes help with toe arthritis. Less movement is less painful. Yeah, yeah, good. Thank you for that feedback, Jill. Okay, well, um, I've gone 50 minutes here. I think it's time to wrap up this episode of Training Cafe. Uh, thank you so much for uh, joining in the conversation. I look forward to doing these every two weeks, uh, even when I'm traveling as I am now. Now, if only the rain would stop here and uh, we could get out and do a little bit of climbing because I have to get home to Pennsylvania and get back to work here. Uh, but uh, thank you so much for tuning in. We will convene again in two weeks. Again, climbers around the world unite over coffee at the training cafe. Until next time, be safe, be strong, and climb on.